Hey guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you and today we finally get to talk about Skylake. Uh, now, right at the very beginning, what I do want to say is we have um, had a little bit of confusion over the last few weeks where uh, Broadwell was kind of launched uh, and Broadwell was the first of the 14 nanometer process CPUs and had the Iris Pro graphics, but uh, Skylake was so close um, that uh, a lot of people kind of did get confused. Now, I did do a, the Broadwell review and I, it is on the Overclock 3D website. So Broadwell was essentially 14 nanometer process and then the um, Iris Pro 6200 graphics. Skylake is now with this, which is again uh, uh, 14 nanometer, but it's the second generation uh, 14 nanometer. And by second generation, I mean it's the second kind of um, bunch of CPUs that we've had. Uh, Broadwell was fifth gen Intel CPUs. Skylake is technically sixth gen. Um, so we have for review today the i5 6600K which is uh, a four core product without hyper threading so four cores four threads and then uh, its uh, native speed is 3.7 gigahertz and then it turbos up to 3.9 gigahertz we've also got to look at the i7 6700K which is a, a four core product with hyper threading so four cores and eight threads then the native speed on that is 4 gigahertz, and then that turbos up to a maximum of 4.2 gigahertz. Obviously, that's without any overclocking and stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff that we do need to talk about because we've got the new Z170 chipset. The Z170 chipset, I have to admit, is actually pretty simple because what they've essentially done is with the older generation like Z97 and things like that, if you wanted to put an M.2 PCI Express drive in, it was uh, the PCI Express lanes, the PCI Express 3 lanes were all on the CPU. And uh, with that you had, um, I do believe it was a maximum of uh, 16. So if you had a graphics card in which took 16 lanes and then you put um, your PCI Express in, you would be halving the PCI Express lanes to your graphics. So that was starting to cause a little bit of a problem because PCI Express storage um, was where everything was going to be able to get the speed and the bandwidth that was required. Um, so what we have now is uh, you have your 16 lanes available on your CPU, but you then also have another 20 lanes of PCI Express that are available on your chipset. Now I've probably got the uh, the older gen stuff maybe slightly wrong, but essentially if you were to be thinking about like putting your PCI Express drives in and stuff, you couldn't, um, uh, if you were to have like SLI for example, and then you run your PCI Express drive in there as well in a Z97 board, you did run into some bandwidth problems with the second GPU and stuff. But essentially what we've got now with this, where we've got a lot of PCI Express available on the chipset, what that has meant is that uh, the M.2 has got its own dedicated lane, so they'll be getting, uh, some boards have got one, some boards have got two, but generally you get uh, four dedicated lanes of PCI Express for that. It means that we've got uh, more lanes for SATA Express, although I still think that's kind of something that came in and is going to fizzle out. Um, it does mean that we've got an awful lot of bandwidth available for USB 3, but it also means that you're going to see a lot more USB 3.1 as well. Um, and these are all things that the chipset is all now going to take um, control of. So for those of you out there thinking about the Samsung SM951 PCI Express drives or like the Kingston Predator PCI Express drive, even if you were using um, just the M.2 and mounting it onto your board as we have with the system that I will show you in a minute, the chipset is now going to be able to take care of that and you're not going to have to worry about you know, graphics and multiple graphics situations because it's all kind of kept separate. So that in itself is a really good thing for mainstream. It means all of you end users out there that want a really fast storage solution, but you know want um, either uh, a big graphics card in one slot or maybe two slightly lower end ones, or let's face it, you could probably go for two higher end ones if you've got the money, but you're going to be able to do that and not have to worry about where your PCI Express lanes are getting shared from between and two. So that's a great thing. The other really good thing is we've now got DDR4 available on the mainstream products and by that I mean I would call Z97 and uh, Z170 the mainstream boards 
whereas I would call the X99 being either the higher tier or the, obviously the more expensive product. So we've got now got DDR4 on Skylake. We are testing on DDR4 now, although the chipset uh, and the CPU technically does support DDR3 as well, so you might end up getting those weird kind of quirky boards with either DDR4 and DDR3 on the same ones, God knows why, or you may get a few rare motherboards out there from, you know, kind of uh, uh, smaller manufacturers or, you know, making more kind of niche products that you may be able to get DDR uh, Skylake with DDR3. Although, to be fair, when I've looked at the prices of DDR4 today, I was actually quite surprised in how the product prices have fallen. Obviously not as cheap as DDR3, but it's the next gen up, so uh, we, but we, will, we will talk about um, product prices later on in the review. So we've got DDR4. We've, uh, with the CPUs, um, we've obviously got things that everyone is kind of used to. So we've got, like I said, the four cores, the hyper-threading. It's obviously a new socket. It's now 1151 rather than 1150. Skylake will not fit in the Z97 stuff and vice versa. So you need a Z170 board um, uh, just so that you know. So if you want to go Skylake, you need a new motherboard. And you, in the same way, you can't buy Skylake and put it in your old motherboard, sadly. Um, but the other thing that is, has been brought to the table, and it's something that I'm going to cover in depth when we do get to the overclocking side of things, is base clock overclocking is back. And I'm not talking about the patheticness of um, you know, one, two, or three megahertz here and there. I'm talking about the difference where you're changing your base clock by hundreds of megahertz. It's almost like back to the days of kind of like the 775 days where you're base clock hunting. Um, and, but what that does mean is when you do change your base clock, it means that your memory speeds are changing instantly. So you're having to play around with dividers. It's going to change your cache ratings because all that moves around. And it brings a whole new level of uh, tweaking back into what I would call, like I said previously, the mainstream products. It does mean that uh, if you're really into your tech and you're tweaking stuff, you are going to have a lot more stuff that you're going to get to play with at a lower price point rather than having to pay um, you know, a lot more money to get onto the X99 to be able to get to play with all of that stuff. But it does also mean that for the beginners that there is a lot more stuff that can go wrong. So you may find that uh, when you do get this stuff, overclocking, uh, you are still going to have the easier side of it, but the, you're gonna also going to have to watch what you're doing. So the learning curve for a lot of people may be really steep. Now, for me, being an old boy, um, I remember all these kind of, uh, the, you know, the, the things that I learned in the, back in the days of the E6600 and E6850s, back when I would say that overclocking was uh, more fun. So the fact that these uh, items are getting brought back in again, um, it, it does make life a lot more interesting. But from a reviewer's point of view, it does mean that I've spent an obscene amount of time having to see how all this stuff works with new kit, uh, new benchmarks and how you know everything kind of uh, do, just doing uh, lots and lots of testing which hopefully I'm going to be able to uh, shrink down into enough to make sense to give you a good video. So we've got lots of things to talk about later on with that. I've got lots of screenshots for you of memory speeds, base clock speeds, multiplier speeds, general speeds and we've got the actual benchmarks so you can see how well the overclocks go forward and stuff. Um, so yes, there is an awful lot for us to get through. So what the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to introduce you to the kit that we're using for this review. Um, essentially, when I did the Broad Realm review, I did the, uh, because of the Iris graphics, what I did is I did a whole lot of testing without a graphics card in at all. So it's very, very CPU and iGPU focused, which is something that we've done uh, for the Sky Lake stuff as well. I'm probably going to, um, short of um, Iris stuff appearing throughout Sky Lake, I might even uh, leave that there. But I did do a lot of um, uh, testing with a GTX 980 Ti as well. So we have covered all the bases. Uh, one thing I will say, if you are interested in all the results, yes, we're going to have them in the video, but uh, it's going to be a really good time for you to click the link or the little card that pops up to go and have a look on the Overclock 3D website, because that's where all of the um, graphs are. 
So in some of the graphs, they might seem quite small, but that will be because we're talking about Broadwell stuff, 4790K, uh, and then the new Skylake stuff. So that's the more CPU based stuff. But in some of the other ones, like uh, a graph that I'll show you later on, which is uh, Cinebench 11.5, you can see there are a lot of results in there because that's something we can compare with lots of uh, different CPUs like the 5960X, 5820. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a whole wealth of stuff for you to go and take a look at there. I will try and put as much of it into the video as possible but honestly, trying to get all of this stuff uh, without a script and just a couple of scribbled notes um, uh, out in a, a timely fashion in a video is really, really difficult. But we're going to take a look at the board because it's actually a really pretty board. Uh, and I do want to spend some time talking with you about that and the memory that I've had in before we move on to talking about crazy uh, base clock speeds and um, the, the overclocking that we've done. So I'm going to be quiet and let's move on to the next section. OK, so here's the first look at the board that we're going to be using for our testing today. It's the Asus Z170A. Now you may be thinking to yourselves, well, why have you started there? Well, it's going to give us a really good baseline for all the rest of the reviews that we're going to do going forward. Now, it's not a bargain basement budget board, but at the same time, it's not massively expensive either. It's what I would call entry level premium kind of product. Uh, I've just found out the price and it's going to be £115. Now obviously the white is quite new because the old uh, Z87 and Z97As were gold and these heat sinks would have been gold and the heat sink here was round with a gold top on it. So the fact they've gone kind of monochrome and they've gone with the contrast of just a little bit of white, the heat sink itself is silver underneath with a tiny tiny little bit of blue on it but it's very very understated and very neutral looking and i actually really like it this is just a plastic cover it's exactly the same sort of material that they made the gtx 970 turbo out of i've made a video on that if you've not seen it and it is just like a little shroud over the top of the uh, mosfet heat sinks these do not get hot in testing at all but you can see that we've got a hell of a lot of phases around the CPU socket there. <coughs> so it does, um, uh, it should help us with the overclocking, which we'll talk about obviously in great detail later on. It does have M.2 on board. Um, uh, and obviously this is now all linked in with the chipset, so it's not going to affect your graphics or anything at all. Nice, easy um, OS drive marker here. There is a power switch down the bottom and you can see that we've got USB 3 and two USB 2s there but there is another USB 3 up here and two USB 3 headers seems to be kind of standard uh, on this range and then we've got um, switches for Easy XMP and then TPU uh, something that I did think was kind of nice and this is only really going to be any use for uh, AIO so all-in-one water coolers is this here is a uh, water pump uh, connector now, uh, I'm not so sure about using it for dedicated water cooling loops, but it will be interesting to test this later on for those AIO loops that do just have a three or a four pin header to be able to test it on this. But sadly, with the H110i GT that I was using uh, as part of the review kit, it's a SATA connector rather than that. So it's not been something I've been able to test uh, in depth. But we'll talk more about the uh, board as we go through the review and I'm going to give it a special uh, section in the conclusion as well. Corsair memory wise, I've had a 3200 MHz 16 GB kit sent in. It's 4 times 4 GHz, 3200 MHz and it's the LPX um, sticks. So they come out looking like this. They did have air coolers in them as well but I've obviously not needed to to use them so we had those i also got um sent a 2666 kit so what i've done is i've done all of the uh basic testing with the 3200 but then when it came to doing memory specific results with ida and sandra i dropped the uh, 2666 kit in as well but i had another kit sent in as well so we've ended up using three different types of memory during this review and I also had this amazing Rip Jaws V or Rip Jaws 5 as it's obviously meant to stand for kit uh, come in. And this is a, an 8 gigabyte kit and it's 3600 megahertz. Yes, you did hear that right. 
when it uh, focuses through. It says it's XMP2 ready, 1.35 volt, and it's, as you can see, 3600 megahertz, CAS 17, it's 17, 18, 38. So thanks to G-Skill for that. Uh, we'll, we have used this in our main overclocks as well, and it's really helped us stress the IMC on the uh, CPUs themselves. But please do, please do listen in about the, uh, uh, these kits, not these kits specifically, but just the high demand that this does put on the uh, memory controller and how you need to be a little bit more in depth with them to get them running. Okay then, so when it comes to overclocking, I'm gonna do the i5 and the i7 separately. And then I'm gonna put lots of screenshots onto the screen for you to kind of validate all this stuff. Because sometimes it's easy just to chuck in a graph and say, oh yeah, we got X amount. But then to actually show the validation is, um, I think it just goes to show that we've, we have put all, all the effort in and all the work in to kind of cover all of this stuff. The only thing that's a little bit woo at the moment is the way that CPU-Z is reading uh, voltages on Skylake. It could need a CPU-Z update, but as I've explained with the fact that the CPU and the cache are kind of all in together, we don't know which way it's split. So this that in itself is going to be something that's going to evolve. But I will tell you what we'd set in the BIOS uh, for the CPU volts anyway, because I'm not going to tell you all the subsidiary volts, because some of it, especially the overclocks, the amount of things that I did have to change to get things running stable, 24 seven stable, you know, so that we could run good benchmarks and stuff was a little bit OTT. Now I do have my notes, so I'm going to refer back to these notes to talk you through them. And then hopefully through the magic of uh, editing rendering that we're going to make uh, the screenshots pop up for you. So the i5 first. Now the i5 was the first CPU to arrive and thankfully it arrived at the beginning of last week whereas the, uh, the i7 actually arrived on Friday because uh, DHL decided to lose it. So the amount of time that we got to spend on these was actually quite limited. But the i5 is obviously the cheap one and it's also the kind of like the cheeky chappy. It's the one that uh, we would normally say to you is going to be the gaming one. Um, but it was actually the, uh, really nice to work with. And like I said, it, it starts life as a 3.7 gigahertz with a 3.9 gigahertz as the turbo. But uh, because we've now got base clock available, we've got memory, we've got the cache, we've got multipliers, we've gone old school with it and separated it out. It's almost a bit like an AMD review, but we've got, what we've done is I've given you a max possible multiplier, I've given you a max possible base clock, um, and then we've gone in and we've done a little bit of memory testing to see how far we can get our memory uh, set high. Obviously, I know I've got sticks that are rated at 36, uh, so, sorry, 3600 megahertz. And then we've gone in and searched for a mix between the two. Now, the, the max possible base clock, sorry, the max possible multiplier that I managed to get out of the i5 was 47, uh, so 4.7 gigahertz. The 4.8 gigahertz was shaky, and I mean like properly shaky, and 4.7 was an absolute, that was a stable, benchable at that. I did get 4.8 gigahertz screenshots, but as soon as you literally opened OCCT or anything, it failed. So we've got 47 stable. The other thing that we did was we went base clock hunting. And one thing I will do is I say I've learned a little bit more about the BIOS with it this, this time. So I think I could probably get the base clock on this a bit higher if I went back to retest. But I'm still quite happy with 280 base clock. Now you can see I did turn the multiplier down to get that result because that was the best way to go about it. But it's a lot of the sideline volts. Um, I was still learning and, you know, taking my notes and, and going through to see what come out best. But for that one, 280 base clock, I was really, really happy with it. Again, when we come to the uh, the memory speed, I couldn't get it above 333, uh, 3,333 megahertz. Um, I think now if I was to go back, I could probably do that because I've learned that a couple of the volts to get it up to 3,466 and 3,600, I could probably get it running. But one of the points that I did want to bring out here is that uh, with the G-Skill kit, um, the XMP itself on 3600 just didn't work. You have to go in and manually set everything. On neither of the CPUs that I have, have I been able to just go in with 3600, select XMP and it work from a stock CPU. It's, it's just not happened. Whether that's an early XMP issue or whether that's just the fact that you do need to be able to go in there and in the BIOS and set everything up yourself manually. But once you get to memory speeds that are that high, it's generally not something that you're just going to expect to plug and play anyway. So we did get 3,333 megahertz with minimal effort. Um, 
Then when we wanted to push on to the uh, full overclock, we already knew that we had 4.7 as available as a uh, just a multiplier clock, but that would have been 47 times 100 base clock. So we went about things slightly differently, where we went 190 base clock times 25 for a 4,750 megahertz overclock. And that was with the voltage set in the BIOS, uh, and obviously that's the CPU cache faults, of just below 1.4 gigahertz, and that was 100% stable. And it also meant that we had a really good cache speed, and as you'll see later on when we start talking about the results, that also meant that it made a, a, a nice difference to the results. I did test some uh, 47 multiplier only scores, but mixing the base clock with the 333 megahertz RAM and a slightly lower multiplier, the base clock um, results did prove better in the testing. <clears throat> so that's the reason why we did that. Yes, I could have done a whole batch of 47 multipliers and a whole batch of base clock stuff, but the graphs would have been a, 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 you know, massively longer and I would, would have just gone mental. It may be something that we'll come back to at a later date and do uh, overclock. Uh, multiplier only versus uh, base clock and multiplier mix but for the the time scale that we had for the Skylake review we chose to just kind of put the the best score up rather than explaining why it was the best score um, so we've got, we've got that and uh, I think 4.7 gigahertz or 4.75 gigahertz with almost a 200 base clock there I think that was uh, pretty spot on I was actually really happy with it it did take a lot of time and a lot of tweaking and a little fannying around to get there but obviously it was a completely new product and I didn't have anyone making videos on YouTube that I could go and watch to see where I should you know the sort of numbers I should be aiming for when we moved on to the i7 uh, same kind of setup first of all the max possible multi that we got out of it was 50 so 5 gigahertz you know bish bash bosh there we go nice and simple just changing the multi 5 gigahertz um, and that was with sensible volts as well don't forget that we're running uh, uh, easily accessible cooling on this, as I've explained to you as well. So there's nothing that we were using that you couldn't get off the shelf. Uh, and if anything, uh, by the fact that I'm running the uh, SP120 LEDs, which have got a lower RPM than the, sorry, SP140 LEDs, that have got a lower RPM than the, uh, the standard fans, if anything, I'm slightly hampering the, ki the, the kit that I've got for the sake of aesthetics. So we've got... 50 possible on the multiplier. Then we moved on to base clock. We got 350 as a maximum possible on that, which again, I was really uh, happy with, but it does go to show you, like I said, I, I got used to things a little bit more with the i7 and I think I could probably get 300 out of the, the i5 now. Although, as you can see, even though we had a really, really low multiplier at that, we were still running over two gigahertz. Uh, and the, a lot of the base clock um, results do make a good healthy difference as well. With the i7 we also got 3600 megahertz running fine as well, um, uh, but like I said it, it was a, a much more involved than I was um, really expecting as far as getting it to run. Even with the i7 I was in and out of the BIOS quite a bit, um, working my way up. I basically started at 3200 megahertz, then went 3333, 3466 and eventually on to 36 got it all 100% stable and uh, when I tell you the maximum overclock that I had in the end that was also running the 3600 megahertz memory as well uh, when we were starting to mix and play around with this something that I did manage to do uh, and it's kind of an old school thing and you're, you're probably going to have to have had some older kit to get the reason why I've included this but we did get a 200 times 20 um, so 200 base clock times 10 to multiplier for 400, 4 gigahertz, um, which is kind of a, it is an old school uh, kind of i5, i7 um, point way, way back in the day. But it was just something that when it came out, I was actually really happy with that. It's something that, it, yeah, you'll know what I mean. If you don't, then uh, just be happy that this type of thing is available now. But then when we wanted to kind of push things a little bit further, uh, what we ended up doing was 200 times 24. Um, and by the way, that 200 times 20 was at um, manually set stock volts, not just left on auto because auto 
isn't stock. If you're on auto and you're overclocking, it's overvolting it for you, children. Um, but yeah, for the maximum possible overclock, we ended up going with 200 times 24 for a 4.8 gigahertz overclock at 1.35 volts. Uh, that was also including 3600 megahertz uh, memory. And to be honest with you, this thing was, uh, especially when we, I'll show you later on with some of the graphs, um, the, the Skylake i7 with the memory running like that, the cache was running at 4.4 gigahertz. It was absolutely lightning. And I'm talking about properly quick. There was a lot of the tests that we were kind of looking at the results going, really? Christ. Um, so that's the overclocking side of things covered, sorted out. There was a lot there. There's going to be more to come. We, li we were literally running uh, on the clock. Uh, so uh, as time progresses, when we start doing other boards, obviously we've started with, as I've explained, a, a slightly lower end board to make things fair. So as we start getting better boards coming through and stuff like that, things are going to get a lot more exciting. And I, I'm already um, properly, properly hooked on Skylake just to kind of give you an idea on what's going on. Okay, so when it comes to uh, the reviews and the, um, the results rather and the, the graphs, we're gonna get them all up and I'll try and chat you through them. But don't forget, you can pause at any moment in time. If there's something that you're not 100% sure about, you can either click the link to go to the Overclock 3D website and see all the write up about it there. Um, if there's either any specific questions, the best place to get hold of me about it is in the threads on the OC 3D forums because it's really kind of difficult to put them in the comments underneath YouTube and they don't tend to be able to help anybody else uh, after either. So I always try and direct you towards my forums because then we can all have a good chit chat. Uh, and it also means that the other members of the forums get to assist you as well because there's a great group of people there. Um, and sometimes it's just nice to be able to work through issues and maybe questions together. And then uh, you're not just relying on me then because there's obviously a lot more people that are gonna be buying Skylake uh, out there and they're gonna be able to help you as well. And also, I'm a busy boy and sometimes I'm not up at three o'clock in the morning to give you an instant answer. But anyway, power draw. Now in here, we've got the 4790K, the uh, Broadwell, uh, 5775C and then we've got the two Skylakes both are overclocked and uh, stock. Uh, the reason why we did this is this is um, the only time that we've ever tested CPUs without a graphics card. So this is just the system power for uh, as the system as is here, no graphics card in it, just the board, memory, little solid state drive, that type of stuff. So it's about as close as we're going to get to be able to give you a, a proper answer. So CPU only, and this is OCCT, completely maxed out. Um, you're looking for the uh, i5, 92 watts, and then 104, 105 watts for the i7. So you're only really paying about you know, a 12, 14 watt difference to have that hyper thread and slightly higher speed, which I think is kind of good. The other good thing to have a look at is when we test it with the graphics, we just put it in uh, 1080p mode, on Valley, no AA, and just let it run. And you can see there that the two CPUs run absolutely nigh on identical at 140 watts um, for that. So if you were gonna use the iGPU, you're not really paying any uh, massive power requirement differences because it's the same graphics chip on there and with Unigen at least, it doesn't draw on the CPU anymore. So that's why those two results are nigh on identical. Um, you can see the difference with the 4790K, that would have been 195 watts. So the fact that we've even got, you know, around the kind of 100 watt mark is pretty much spot on, really. The other thing to consider with the, um, the fact that the, uh, the Skylake and the Devil's Canyon CPUs are pulling the same amount of watts, you also need to think that the Devil's Canyon was running a little bit quicker as well at 4.4 gigahertz. So in that respect, it's not brilliant. The power requirement differences there aren't, you know, there isn't a great deal of it. Oh, well, there isn't any of it. When we move on to the overclocking, you've got uh, 116 watts versus 120 watts for the, um, uh, the CPU only, which is uh, a really good kind of, you can see that the, when they do get overclocked and pushed, the, 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 the gap narrows, so the power that these actually use, essentially the best way to put it is the hyper threading, does it use a lot more power? No. Not really, even with a huge overclock on it. Um, and then you've got the um, Broadwell right at the top, which uses the most power out of everything, and that's because of the, the size of the graphics chip 
that was on there. The, the Iris Pro, you know, if you have a lot of graphics cores on there, it's going to use a lot more power, and that's why it's at the top of the graph we're using the most. When we get to Cinebench, this is the good CPU results here, where you can see that we've got um, right at the very top the 5960X, where you'd expect it to be. But I, for one, think that uh, the considering the, the we're talking about cores and threads here, everything above the overclock 6700K has got uh, six cores uh, and 12 threads minimum. It's actually gone above, when you look at it, the um, uh, 3960X. That's a six core, 12 thread CPU. And with a bit of an overclock, it's pumped up there. And you can see that 11.7 versus 11.36. I mean, the standard 3930K was 11, but that is a really good um, CPU uh, 3D rendering uh, program. I'd ignore the OpenGL side of it um, uh, within reason. I'd concentrate on the, the CPU side of things there, because 11.5, like I said, because we've got so many results in it, it does give you a good kind of inclination of you know where things are. But if we go down towards the bottom of the graph, you can see that the, you've got some um, AMD processors in there. You've even got um, the i5 is putting out a better score than uh, an FX8150 at 4.7 gigahertz. We move on again, this is IDA, uh, and this is CPU Queen. And you can see that we've got the uh, 6700K with its overclock right at the top of the graph. Um, it's uh, the um, i5 with the 4.7 gigahertz, only just below the 5960X with its overclock. And I think the reason why there's such a stark difference between these, when you look how far down the graphs the standard ones are, I think it's because CPU Queen really likes the base clock. Um, and I do think that uh, the base clock will become uh, something that a lot of programmers will utilize because there's a, there's, uh, yeah, it's just gonna be something that I think they're gonna respond to really well, especially if you're willing to put the time in, to put your overclocks in, get all your memory set up and everything. Because that's another point there, is uh, with the huge memory speeds and the cache that's all up there, it really opens up the abilities of the CPU. We move on to SciSoft. Sandra, uh, this is another one we can see it does very, very well compared to the uh, other CPUs, especially like the slightly older CPUs. The 6700K and the i5 both go above the um, uh, 5820K. Is it going to wake up again or should I have just left it? There we go. go both goes above the 5820K. You also get 4960X in there. Again, I know I'm reading all these graphs out, but it does just mean that you can pause, have a look, and if you want to skip to the next graph, then obviously you can do. PC Mark 8 was another uh, good one, um, uh, but it was one of the ones where the PC Mark is obviously like a normal usage kind of suite, and you can see here that the 5820K and the 5960X actually did really, really well in this. Um, so, uh, but you can also see that the, uh, the overclock did help it a little bit there as well. But as a, as a more kind of normal usage kind of scenario, the normal usage, the overclock didn't make an immense amount of difference and the, just the sheer grunt of the extra cores on the other processors did help it a little bit more there. Um, something else we did, which was uh, something, it's something I'm probably not gonna do a lot of, if I'm honest, and that's uh, we did some 3D mark tests without the uh, graphics card in there. And we did just do, um, just CPU results. So these can be quite interesting on that HD GPU side of things, um, HD 530. But I know a lot of you are just going to want to know about your graphics cards. And it's obviously going to be very graphics card specific. With the motherboard reviews that we're going to be rolling out um, uh, coming after this, we're going to be doing all of our testing with a 980 tie. And that's generally so that we can do a lot of 4K results um, uh, and really kind of stress the kit that's going on there. But this may be interesting for some of you that may be looking at this as a possibility for using it as a HTPC machine or something. Although we are hearing there is a possibility, it's not confirmed, but there might be uh, i5 and Pentium versions of this coming in late September. And that's the end of all the graphs. And you're all like, oh, thank God for that. And to be fair, even I am thank God for that because it means I can put that stuff aside and then we need to uh, recap, get in a conclusion and uh, get into the thick of that so that you can actually hear my personal thoughts on how all of this has panned out. Okay, so a little bit of a location change and I'm gonna try and stare straight into the camera rather than staring at the uh, pretty boy at the side. <coughs> anyway, so Skylake, oh, 
it's been emotional. There's been so much work to do because it's been totally new. We've got base clock back, memory overclocking, cache overclocking, trying to get everything balanced out. But it's been the first kind of like uh, hardcore review series that I've done in a long time that I've really kind of welcomed the late nights and the, you know, having to keep notes going in there, not understanding stuff, trying to get things worked out. But this uh, recap on a few bits and bobs. The Asus Z970A, entry level premium, like I said, uh, it's gonna come in at 115 pounds. And I think the, the old Z970A with all the gold and stuff on it, it did make it look kind of lower end and you know not quite as nice. This has an, I mean, I know I'm a bit of a white fanboy anyway, but it does have a much more premium feel about it. There's a lot of stuff on that board that you would be surprised to get for 115 quid. Let's not also forget that for your £115, I did all of that overclocking. Um, so it's not that the, excuse me, it's because I've drunk water. It's not that the board is cheap um, and uh, is not going to get you anywhere. Let's say if you had the exact same CPU that I have or you took my CPU away with you, if you spent some time in that BIOS, you could be running uh, 24 times 200 with your memory at 3600 on a board that cost 115 quid and I think it actually does look really nice in there as well. Let's not forget that Asus have got the Z9 uh, GDX 970 Turbo which is white which would be, fit in there really nicely and essentially the point is is uh, I spent a lot of time working on that board and generally with the cheaper boards when it comes to the overclocking and the tweaking and trying to get everything running it does get kind of temperamental and this board if I got some settings wrong it just literally it would hang on the BIOS you hard reset it off, it would go off, press it again, and it would boot up straight away, go in and say overclocking failed, you go in, make some changes, and get back out again. It really didn't skip a beat. Now, I don't normally do this, but for in, in this occasion, I am going to give the Z970A a gold award, plain and simply because it got me through this without any problems. I wasn't having to ask for extra BIOSes. I wasn't having to ask for, you know, does this work? Should I have been able to have done this? Should I have been able to have done that? It's done everything that I've asked of it, and it comes in, I thought it was going to be about 130, 135 pounds, to be honest with you. So the fact that it's coming at 115 is just unreal. And I personally think that if you're going to spend that sort of money and you've got the i5, spent a bit of time overclocking it, you'd absolutely run away with the fairies. The G-Skill memory, yes, 3600 megahertz, absolutely um, uh, crazy speed at the top end, but the, it may put a lot of people off that the at XMP just didn't work. To be fair, what I would probably do is enable the XMP so that you can go in and look at all the settings where you need to put them, um, like your memory timers and stuff, and go in there and then do that type of stuff manually. The problem is, is it does need a lot of the, or maybe it's because it was on the Z170A, uh, we won't know until I test later on, but it, the, the, it wouldn't just instantly boot at that could be asking too much for the board, it could be the fact that the settings weren't quite there for the XMP, I'm not 100%, but as you can see with those memory performance results and the overclocks and stuff, things were absolutely screaming off into the distance, so it's an epic kit, but it's obviously, it's going to cost a few quid when it does get released, because it's the top end of where stuff's going to be, be going, um, but you are going to need to be a little bit more hands-on. I don't think that you should be buying it unless you're going to be one of these overclocky boys anyway. It's certainly not something where you're going to want an i5 and a, um, the at stock and then the memory at 36, for example. I think it's something you really do need to get involved with um, to get the best from it. We've had the Corsair stuff. The Corsair 3200 LPX is the memory that I'm going to be using for the uh, throughout all of the testing um, as like the kind of static stuff. But we obviously did do, if you go and have a look on the website, we did some 2600 megahertz stuff as well. Um, 2666. Now this is the point, this is the reason why I wanted to talk about this. The Corsair memory, I did look it up. I couldn't find any prices for the G-School yet because it's not out. But uh, I found the 3200 megahertz kit uh, for £190. Now I was expecting that to be closer to 300 But the biggest surprise, although I would personally say 2666 would be uh, under where I would want to be head put in my money, if it was my money I would be buying at least 2800 megahertz as a baseline. Um, but 2666 megahertz memory uh, for a 16 gigabyte kit was £105 and that's DDR4 prices not DDR3. 
So that's the kit that we used. Um, uh, and the, the Corsair stuff is obviously that's some great prices there. So that's all available to any of you guys that are thinking about switching Skylake. You can obviously see that I've used it, had it running, overclocked, all works absolutely fine. Um, the XMP worked on those as well, by the way. I think, again, that might have been because it was um, slightly lower uh, speed at the end of the day or lower bandwidth. Um, but still, it was easy to get in, tick the box, do you know what I mean? And it worked. Uh, something that I will say as well is the uh, the 26, six, this could all be down to silicon lottery. And if you don't know what I mean by silicon lottery, then essentially it's not all chips are the same. They don't all perform the same. But my 2666 kit was um, booting, running absolutely fine at 3200 megahertz. I don't know whether it was just the same modules, but they're, um, yeah, for the ones that I've seen, the speed binning on them, um, the chips seem a lot more capable than the sticks they're getting put on. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to doing some uh, dedicated memory overclocking at a later date with a range of sticks <clears throat> to see where we can go with this stuff. So that could be really interesting as well. Um, so essentially, like I said, the Z170A, I'm going to give it a gold award just because it's got me through this and thank the Lord it was simple um, uh, and didn't, was, wasn't fighting against me. Uh, and then obviously the, the, all the memories that are there, they're uh, available out there at some really good prices. I thought they were more expensive. But anyway, we now need to move on to the conclusions for the CPUs and the i5 and the i7. You can't really give them anything but gold awards, can you? To be honest with you, uh, it's like gold award and then the, um, uh, the i7, I want to give a performance award as well because it's just, it's great, but it comes with an air. Uh, and, and essentially what I mean is uh, the i5 is going to be an absolute cracker that's still going to be the one I think is going to be the one that most of you gamers are going to want to pick up um, and get busy with the overclocking if you can don't be afraid of it but when it does come to that overclocking you do need to be prepared to get your hands dirty uh, and by get your hands dirty I mean don't be afraid to come and ask us on the forums for some help with your balance and your base clock um, uh, one thing I will say is if you do post on the forums, make sure that you put a USB drive in the back of your board and press F12 when you're in the BIOS because it will save a file to BIOS and you can post it up on the forum so we can work out where you're going wrong. Because most of the time, if you're having problems with stuff, it's going to be because your memory looks, you know, it's going to be running too fast or your, uh, your cache will be running away in the distance because you've not manually set it. Oh, look, it's Dobby, Dobby the cat. Um, anyway, so Toby's not liking that, so we're going to put him down. So, um, when it comes to the overclocking, it's, it's going to be down to that. But these chips really do um, uh, love a bit of fettling. So, uh, it's going to be the days where you're going to be in and out of your BIOS for a long time. And that may, that may put people off, but just multiply our overclocking. Uh, the scores from my testing have shown that we're significantly down on even the same end speed but then upping that base clock and having a slightly lower multiplier so the the base clock overclocking is um, probably where you're going to want to uh, focus your efforts if um, you're you know you are really looking for the, the, the to make your rig quicker basically so it's a great thing and I really like that but it's going to scare some people off uh, for the for the people that are slightly you know worried about that sort of stuff do it in small chunks you can clear your BIOS at the end of the day. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. And as long as you're not um, uh, leaving your CPU volts on auto, you should be 100% fine to go through that. Once they're manually set, they can't go up any further and you'll be fine. Just take it in steps. Um, so the performance is absolutely unreal. We've actually got some proper tweaking, enthusiast level tweaking available again because the base clock's back. It's going to make things complicated for a lot of people, but for other, you know, us hardware enthusiasts, it does mean the glory days of proper fettling is back. Um, and to try and uh, fit all of this into such a narrow review, you know, slot window and testing has been crazy. But over the next coming weeks and months, as we get to know the boards and, you know, the quirks of the CPUs and stuff, things are going to crack on. And you can expect a lot of uh, content from, from me on uh, all of this stuff. So the i7 is an absolute cracker. I'd say that the IMC was slightly stronger on my version of that, and you can get a slightly higher overclock. 
but they're both kind of heading around the kind of 4.7 to 4.8 gigahertz mark. We're not going to know until the retail stuff comes through whether there are going to be some silicon lottery winners with people getting five and higher base clock and stuff, but these are all the exciting times ahead. So the long and short of it is, if you didn't kind of guess already, that Skylake is epic and um, the Intel have brought tweaking back to the people that aren't, um, uh, you know, completely like flush with money. Because before, if you wanted to do all this type of stuff, it meant you having to buy X99 and that was, you know, that was out of the reach for most people. Now you can pick up yourself an i5 6600K and get busy with it. Um, you can run two graphics cards if you want and you can still run your N.2 um, solid state drives or your SATA Express stuff. So it's brought a lot more stuff into this entire package um, and there's a lot more stuff to play with. But for now, at least, I need to go off, have another drink of water because I'm losing my voice with this video. It's been so long. But Skylake, was it worth the wait? You bet you're right now it was. But for now, at least, this is Tiny Tom Logan with another video for you. Out. Ding! Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs>